It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you so, so much, Speaker. Uh, can I just say to the minister across the way, that was very moving, and I know you're feeling a lot of emotions right now, and that was, that was lovely, as well as the other speakers also. But, Speaker, my first question this morning is, in fact, to our Premier. Uh, we all know that our health care heroes uh, gave their all during the pandemic. They, they gave their all, and now they are absolutely burned out. Uh, the nurses uh, in our, our province, in our hospitals, in all healthcare set settings really did deliver for us, but their government simply didn't have their backs. Now we know that they continue to face really difficult situations at work. There are staffing shortages that are massive. Their workloads on their wards are extremely heavy. They feel disrespected because of this government's low-wage policy, Bill 124, and they continue to face significant mental distress. Yesterday, the Federation of Nurses Question. told Parliament over 80 per cent of nurses report insufficient staffing in their workplace, with two-thirds saying the quality of care has, has de declined over the last year. My question is simple. Where is this Premier's plan to retain, recruit uh, and uh, return health care workers to our health care system? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Speaker, and thank you very much for the question. We certainly recognize the tremendous work that's been done by nurses across the province for the last two years. We know that they have, in many cases, had to sacrifice their uh, being with their own families, especially before vaccinations started. And we recognize that a strong nursing workforce is critical as we move forward into our recovery phase uh, past COVID. And that's why our government is investing in a number of different ways in order to retain nurses first of all, and we're investing $763 million to provide Ontario's nurses with a lump sum retention incentive of up to $5,000 per person. That's equal, equivalent to about a 6.9% increase. But there's more than that. We are retaining and we're recruiting more and more nurses in order to be able to allow for some of the nurses who've been on the front lines for the last two years to be able to have the uh, the uh, time off that they need because many of them have been at work virtually the entire last two years. Response. So we, are, we, we need to do more work both to retain what we have but also to recruit more people and I'll speak to that in the supplementary. The supplementary question. Uh, speaker, if this minister doesn't know she ought to that uh, their, um, their uh, one-time payment with strings attached was largely panned by nurses. They still feel very disrespected. But it's not just nurses, Speaker. It's not just nurses. Medical lab professionals processed millions, millions of COVID tests and other samples over the last two years. Their new report says that they are experiencing burnout as well. Michelle Ho, the CEO of the Medical uh, Laboratory Professionals Association, said this, and I quote, We have a mass exodus of people leaving the profession because they are tired of feeling unappreciated. They, too, are disrespected by this Premier's low-wage policy, Bill 24. So my question is, why does this Premier insist on continuing to disrespect and drive out health care professionals in this province with his low-wage policy, Jim. including our medical lab techs. Minister of Health. In fact, what we're doing is supporting all of our health care professionals with the investments that we've made. We've made investments to support our nurses. We made investments previously with pandemic pay to help people get through this time period and to recognize their efforts, knowing that they were in many cases having to leave their families behind. They were working extra shifts. We recognize that all frontline health care professionals have been through a great deal, and that is why we are spending additional monies in order to recruit and retain more health care professionals. We've also uh, recognized that we need more physicians in Ontario. That's why we're expanding, for the first time in the last 10 years, the number of undergraduate and postgraduate spaces for physicians and to train more doctors for northern and rural areas. But we recognize that there are also other frontline professionals that need help. That's why we've expanded the number of beds available. We're expanding the number of professionals. Spons. They're going to be able to be trained at some of these uh, locations, including the uh, 
a new medical centre, medical school in Brampton uh, that is going to be started by Ryerson that will also be able to train other healthcare professionals, including lab techs, including nurses and other frontline healthcare well, professionals. Fair enough. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, the reality is the staffing crisis continues to be a problem in our health care centre, our health care uh, services, rather, and this government should not be surprised by that. Back in October, the Premier's own science table uh, flagged them with, with, this, uh, with this concern, and I quote, sustained burnout will likely contribute to staff retention challenges due to health care providers leaving their workplaces and professions. A vicious circle may be underway where Understaffing leads to increased burnout and an even weaker health care workforce. That spiral is underway, Speaker, but it doesn't have to be this way. This can be fixed, and we can start fixing it by ripping up the government's Bill 124 low-wage policy. So my question is, when nurses, when PSWs, when lab technicians, when the government's own science table are ringing the alarm bells that something needs to happen and it needs to Questions? happen fast, why is he stubbornly refusing to fix it, to fix it and get rid of Bill 124, his low-wage policy? Minister of Health. We are dealing with it by uh, re retaining the frontline health care professionals that we have, by recruiting more people, and providing them also with the supports that they need if they are facing exhaustion, burnout. In some cases, uh, many of them need mental health supports. We are providing that. We are providing that at both in terms of online assistance, but for people that need frontline interpersonal care, they can receive that as well. But we're also getting ready for the future by building the uh, support at the Runnymede Centre that is going to be for frontline professionals. That includes frontline police officers, frontline uh, firefighters, but also frontline health care workers, because we know it can often be more difficult for them to obtain support in a traditional setting. We are creating a centre that is going to be for them when they are facing burnout, when they have mental health or addiction needs. This is going to be a centre specifically for frontline health care providers and frontline providers for other services. Thank you. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is uh, for the Premier. We all know it's been a difficult couple of years in our schools in this province. Uh, there's been a new report issued by the People for Education, an organization that does a lot of work uh, in terms of our education system. And in that report, it says that 90%, 90% of principals found that the pandemic was extremely difficult to navigate for the staff that they were responsible for. The report says the stress on teachers and education workers is resulting in an absolute crisis in our education system, a staffing crisis that's significant and that they're very worried about. Worse, the group is calling for action, and they have been doing so for some time, but they're being ignored by this Premier and his minister. So my question is, why is the Premier and the minister, why are they ignoring our kids and our schools and the workers that work in those places, Question. the folks that who support our children and our families. Why are they being ignored by this government? Thank you very much. And I wish to thank the Leader of the Opposition for her question. But, Speaker, I think it's important that we take a step back and we look at the investments, the historic investments that have been made by this government, by Premier Ford and Minister Lecce, and the entire uh, Government of Ontario in our education system. Truly historic investments uh, that have been forced and, in, and built upon the health and safety measures that we put in place based on the recommendations of the Chief Medical Officer of Health and, of course, his team. And I want to speak a little bit about some of the specifics. We've seen that this year alone. Under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government is increasing investment in public education by $683 million, the single largest investment in Ontario's history. That's a substantial investment. What this means is that on an average provincial per pupil basis funding, funding is going to be over $13,000 per student for the first time in our province's history. There's a $92 million increase in the special education grant funding through the GSN, being projected to increase to over $3.25 billion. Substantial funding that's ensuring our students receive the best education possible. The supplementary question. 
Well, Speaker, in the report that I was referring to in my first question, principals shared stories of the hardships that they've been facing uh, during the pandemic, and I'm going to share some of those with the government because apparently they're unaware. Uh, one principal said, and I quote, families are undergoing significant stress. I have a staff member breaking down in my office over stress at least once a week. It's a lot to take in. Another one said, without, and I quote, without an increase in supports to keep schools open safely, the impact of educational funding cuts, which is what's happening, especially during a pandemic on our community, will only worsen. Order. The government cut $500 million from education just uh, in the, the last uh, review. That's not going to fix what's broken. Order. Cuts by this government are not going to fix what's broken in our education system. So, when is the Premier going to start Question. investing in education? Stop cutting and fix what's broken to make sure our educators and our students get the kind of schools that they deserve. Number four. There you go. Very much, the leader of the official opposition must have been a victim of discovery math, because the reality is, is that on this side of this house, we have invested the largest, the single largest amount in public education in Ontario's history. Our government's investments in public education have increased each and every single year since taking office, rising 9% in the 2022-23 school year when compared to before our government took office. This is a substantial amount of investment, and it is ensuring that. Each each and every student in the province of Ontario is receiving the safe and supportive environment that they need to learn. It's ensuring that each and every student is receiving the staffing support through our education workers. And I want to speak about a few of the specifics. We recently announced a detailed plan, Ontario's Learning Recovery Action Plan, to strengthen the learning recovery in reading and math, anchored by the largest provincial investments in supports, summer learning, mental health, and special education in our province's history. These Response? are real dollars that are going into our education system, including $176 million being expanded to access free publicly funded tutoring in small groups, a largest summer learning investment in Ontario's history, $15 million, expanded teacher-led online tutoring in English and French with more days and grades offered to more students, and of course, very important as we deal with the consequences of the pandemic, the largest mental health Response? investment in Ontario's history, more than $90 million, a quadrupling of what we saw under the former Wayne Del Duca government. Final well, Speaker, well, Speaker, it is uh, it is certainly not surprising that this government is denying the cuts they're making to education, but the evidence is very clear. And in fact, that report's sure. conclusions should be an alarm bell for this government. And the fact that it's not is truly frightening. Here's another quote from that study. The Ontario government and education system have allowed students, staff, and families to go without the support, resources, and action plan needed to navigate this crisis. But, Speaker, it didn't have to be this way. In fact, it still doesn't have to be this way. We can invest. We can invest in our schools and in our classrooms. We can build a system that has the supports that our children need. We can take care of our excellent staff and give them the respect that they deserve. Together, we actually can, actually can fix what's broken in our education system, but we have to stop Question. the cuts and make the necessary investments. And so my question is, why won't this Premier do exactly that? Very much, Speaker, and I have to correct the record because under the leadership of this Premier, the government has increased uh, funding the publicly funded education system each and every year by historic amounts to ever increase in levels to ensure that every student of this province receives an education that they can be proud of, that they can ensure they're prepared for the jobs of today Order. and tomorrow. But I want to speak a little bit about some of the specific issues that were uh, mentioned by the member opposite, although, of course, uh, clearly she hasn't had the opportunity to go through some of the budget items that express how much we're increasing supports for public education. We've invested over $300 million, uh, million dollars to hire 2,350 new staff, and we also announced an agreement with the Ontario Teachers Federation to deliver access to thousands of retired educators. We've increased the 50-day reemployment rule to 95 days for retired teachers, principals, and vice principals Order. in the public school system. We've expanded the use of temporary certificates to a new cohort Spons. of Ontario teacher candidates. This will allow approximately 3,400 additional certificates to teacher candidates this year alone. These are the sorts of measures that we are taking as a government to ensure that each and every classroom in this province has good staff in front of it. Each and every classroom is safe, supported with ventilation, with proper and adequate access to uh, infection control measures. Thank you.
Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Through to the Premier. In October 2020, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing issued a minister's zoning order to enable a medical innovation park on unserviced farmland in Oromodonte. The MZO was sought by developers with political and donor ties to the PC party. By granting the MZO, the government claimed it would accelerate the production of PPE, vaccines, and other medical supplies. But none of that happened, Speaker. The Medical Innovation Center was never built. Instead, the property owner put the land up for sale for $26 million, citing the MZO as a key selling point. Through you, Speaker, why is the Premier handing out MZOs just to boost the property values of friends and donors to the PC party? Yeah, I'll yeah, no, caution members who uh, can't impute motive. Uh, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing wishes to reply. Yeah. I, absolutely, Oral Speaker. I want to reply. That, you know, those are unfounded allegations Oral that the member should really seriously reconsider when he's posing a question. Uh, again, Speaker, I've said this many times. Uh, minister zoning orders come at the request of the local council. Right. Therefore, priority projects uh, that that council determines are needed and are necessary in their community. Uh, I understand that uh, that property is, is not uh, for sale. That information, uh, while it might have been correct several months ago, is not the case today. Uh, we're going to continue to work with that council uh, to ensure that the project uh, and the zoning uh, meets uh, the intent of the minister's zoning order. Thanks, the member, for the question. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. According to a Terranet search, the Oromodonte property was bought in April 2020 for $2.6 million, six months before the MZO was issued. Then the property owner put the land up for sale for $26 million, 10 times what they had paid for it less than two years before. Same land, all that had changed was the MZO. This government has issued 80 MZOs in just the last three years, more than five times what the previous government issued in 15 years. More than half, more than half of those MZO speakers, more than half have benefited friends or donors to the Premier and the PC party. When will the Premier stop corrupting the planning system with special favours to his friends and donors? So, again, I say to the member for Niagara Centre, you can't impute motive with a question or any statement in the House. Member for Niagara Centre. Order. Order on the government side. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks for withdrawing that. That's uh, only the uh, important thing that uh, the NDP should be doing, Speaker. But, you know, the fact of the matter is, let, let's, let's do the compare and contrast. And the, and the Leader of the Opposition can chirp all she wants. But, you know, here's the compare and contrast. We want to build Ontario up. We want to work with municipalities. That's we right. want to ensure that municipalities can build the housing, can have the job board, yeah. can, can have a basis to move Ontario. We all believe on this side of the House is the economic engine of our country. Again, Speaker, Liberals and New Democrats will always gravitate to a coalition against development, against Jeez. prosperity, against local councils. Just we are going to continue to work with councils to ensure that our province leads the nation. Speaker. Here, here. Restart the clock. Member for Bruce Gray Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's always a pleasure to stand up in the House to represent the communities in my great riding of Bruce Gray Owen Sound. And I want to thank the Minister of Infrastructure. $17 million to Gray County for 3,982 house connections, $16 million to Bruce County for 5,225,000 homes. 
as part of the Southwestern Integrated Fibre Technology or SWIFT program. Mr. Speaker, and just last week, Great County announced that they would be using some of their provincial funding to minimize the increase of property taxes from a 3.75 per cent hike to a 2.88 per cent increase. Great. This is great news for the use of funding that will go a long way in putting money back in the pockets of the hardworking people of Gray County. And I look forward to seeing the other projects that will be funded. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the Minister of Infrastructure please share with us how our government is supporting critical infrastructure projects in my riding? To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much uh, for the question. There's no question that our small, rural and northern municipalities have been the victim of chron chronic underfunding to support their infrastructure backlog by the previous government. That is why our government committed an additional $1 billion annually in our fall economic statement, bringing our total investment to $2 billion per year over the next five years for, for the Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund. These investments will help 424 small, rural, and northern municipalities, including those in southwestern Ontario, build and repair their infrastructure, such as roads, bridges, and water and wastewater systems. As part of our investment, 13 communities throughout the area, including Bruce and Gray counties, will see over $12 million to support local projects for more than 266,000 residents to provide safe Response. and reliable infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, these people are getting the infrastructure that they so desperately deserve. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for her great response. I know this funding will go a long way to support the municipalities in my riding and across our great province of Ontario. Now, Mr. Speaker, I know that our government is working tirelessly to connect Ontarians to high-speed internet, an issue that is very important in my riding and, again, across the province. In areas of southwestern Ontario, including Gray and Bruce County, we're retaining and attracting young farmers and seeing increases in their earnings. Despite the increasing population and drive for more farmers, many of these farmlands don't have the connections they need to connect to reliable, high-speed internet, an essential service they rely on heavily to access information to make business decisions, market their products, operate on-farm technology, and much more. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Infrastructure please explain how our government is helping these farmers in my riding and across our great province, connect the, in helping them connect to compete in today's economy? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for his hard work. Our government is investing a historic $4 billion in high-speed internet infrastructure and has committed to full connectivity province-wide by the end of 2025. <laughs> Through the Southwestern Integrated Fiber Technology or SWIFT, more than 63,000 homes and businesses are being connected to high-speed internet services in the region. And we didn't stop there, Mr. Speaker. We invested a total of $255 million to connect 58,000 more homes and businesses across southwestern Ontario. Construction is underway for 53 projects, and SWIFT is on track to complete construction by June 2023. Our government is saying yes to building Ontario and yes to connecting all Ontarians. The next question, member for the University of Brooklyn. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Experts have been warning us for years that home prices are being driven up by investors who anonymously buy and sell homes in Ontario and Canada to store wealth, launder money and cheat on their taxes. The BC government found that money laundering in the real estate sector caused house prices to skyrocket by 5 per cent in just one year. Experts in the NDP agree. To stabilise housing prices and stop tax evasion and money laundering in the real estate sector, we must bring in a land registry and require secret investors to reveal their true identity. But this government doesn't want to do it. Why is this government allowing anonymous investors to drive up the cost of housing beyond what Ontarians can afford? To respond, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks, Speaker. Uh, I want to thank the member for the question. She had a very similar question. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I know the Minister of uh, Finance uh, gave a really good answer, and I'll, I'll let him uh, deal with the supplemental. Um, our government has been uh, crystal clear uh, throughout our mandate uh, that all housing options are, are on the table, and we've spent a lot of time uh, early on in our term looking at housing supply, 
something that uh, the, the laughing leader of the opposition uh, has voted against every Giggler. time. She's the Giggler. Um, again, we had a bill that protected sure. tenants and strengthened community housing, something you'd think New Democrats would be in favor of. Again, they vote against it. Uh, you, you know, even some of our measures, including the Howdy Housing Affordability Task Force, and it's interesting that some members support some of the issues, but don't support Spons? some of the others. There's a bit of a, a challenge in that caucus in terms of getting their housing policy. But you know what's not in their housing policy, Speaker? Not one word. And that's supporting our call to the federal government for the $490 million that they owe us. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you. My question is back to the Premier. Uh, so, a new report from Transparency International Canada reveals that Ontario and Canada are being marketed in Russia and elsewhere as great places for money laundering and fraud. Countries like the UK are rushing to pass legislation to create a public land registry to expose and stop money laundering and fraud, and a similar bill has been sitting in our legislature for months, yet this government does nothing. Why are Russian oligarchs and other transnational criminals still allowed to take advantage of Ontario's weak transparency laws and hide financial crimes in our real estate sector? Mr. Finance, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that very important question. Uh, you know, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure she's uh, she's read the fall economic statement that I tabled in this House uh, November 4th of uh, 2021. Yes, she's nodding her head, so she has. And of course, uh, as you know, uh, would anyone would note that the government we introduced the Ontario Business Corporations Act as a measure to prevent and better detect the uh, use of corporations for tax evasion money laundering or other illicit financial activities, Mr. Speaker. So that's right there in the fall economic statement. We're taking action. Uh, but let me tell you something else, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing was talking about is the imbalance of supply and demand of housing. We're welcoming people right across the world to this province, the Ukrainians, our Minister of Labour and our Premier, welcoming Ukrainians to this great province. Mr. Speaker, they have to have a place to live. We have to build houses. We have to build supply, and we won't rest until we start to build more houses and more places to live in this great province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, just before the March break, I tabled a private member's bill in relation with a very important issue, human trafficking. Bill 99 seeks to help survivors with their financial burden as they try to recover a normal way of living. Survivors of human trafficking often find themselves with huge debts they, that were forced upon them, like credit cards and student loans, and it's really nothing else than financial fraud. I'm proposing that these course debts be forgiven and that information on the debts not be made available when the finances of the survivors are evaluated. Discrimination on the basis of someone having been trafficked is sadly common in the financial sector. So my question is, will the government support my bill to put a stop to this heartless practice? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for that very important question. And this is something on this side of the House we take very seriously. And in my former role as Associate Minister of Women and Children's Issues, I was one of the co-leads on developing the anti-human trafficking strategy. So our government has taken continuous action um, on this, um, this issue. Uh, in the past, the Ministry of Colleges and Universities has exercised uh, discretion to forgive Ontario student loans. Uh, and debt for human trafficking survivors based on financial hardships, um, economic considerations, or other circumstances that do not warrant the collection um, of these debts. Uh, these requests are conducted on a case-by-case -case basis, and as part of the review, the Ministry looked at individual circumstances, uh, including documentation that was provided, um, such as police reports. So I know I, I have addressed uh, a letter that you sent to my office. This is a, a very important uh, issue, and I know I have more information in the, the follow-up about the the strategy that we have developed and the importance that this Response. government takes uh, towards human trafficking victims. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I very much appreciate the intent uh, you know, of the response and trying to help with the debts, but I think we need a legislation that addresses that in a systemic way to make sure that these survivors are protected. The United States did recently pass a law barring the collection 
in consideration, of course, that's encouraging human trafficking. And I think Ontario should do the same. Human trafficking is a horrible crime that targets women, racialized people, and vulnerable people. And I, I find it alarming that kids in our school are among the victims. And I think that we should do everything possible to at least help the survivors. So will the government be taking concrete steps to ensure that survivors of human trafficking aren't prevented from taking their life back because of financial fraud? Yeah, the Minister of Children and Women's Issues. So Thank you so much. I just want to first of all say when I first got this portfolio, I went with Minister Lecce, Soljan, and we went to a school just for that alone to make sure that the school boards would be able to recognize when kids would be human trafficked, and it was an honor to be there, and I was very blessed to be part of that right after Minister Dunlop. Everyone deserves uh, freedom from exploitation. Unfortunately, Ontario is a hub for human trafficking and has the most police reported incidents of human trafficking in Canada. That is why our government created Ontario's anti-human trafficking strategy and we have committed to investing $307 million over the next five years. Our anti-human trafficking strategy is focused on four key areas raising awareness, which I just spoke about, protecting victims and intervening early, supporting survivors, and holding offenders accountable. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for Scarborough, Rouge Park. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Speaker, the economic impact of the pandemic has many young Ontarians worried about entering the workforce, getting jobs, and developing meaningful and stable careers. Students both across the province and right at home in my riding want to be secure in their future endeavors. We all know a skilled workforce will be an important driver for Ontario's economy and competitiveness. Students who choose to enroll in post-secondary education should be rewarded for their hard work and dedication by getting a job that will support them throughout their lives. Mr. Speaker, through you, could the minister tell us what is being done to ensure students in post-secondary education get the education and skills needed to lead meaningful career? Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Scarborough Rouge Park for, for all of your hard work. I know we're meeting this afternoon for an exciting announcement in your area. Our government puts students first through supporting the economy, jobs, and benefiting hardworking Ontarians. And this month, we've announced exciting initiatives for students. Throughout the pandemic, we have seen PSWs be the true heroes, and we are incredibly appreciative of the private career colleges who have trained countless students for their heroic roles in health and long-term care. That is why earlier this month, our government relaunched the Personal Support Worker Challenge Fund for private career colleges to support up to 4,000 PSW students in Ontario. This $54.7 million investment will not only address the shortages of PSWs in the province, but also support students for meaningful careers in healthcare. Our government says yes to making investments that will ensure Ontarians have access to the healthcare they need and private career colleges have an excellent track record for preparing response. students for in-demand roles in health and long-term care. We are committed to preparing students for critical jobs, caring for some of the most vulnerable people as we build a more resilient and stronger health care system in Ontario. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the Minister for her answer and for her ongoing commitment to supporting students in Ontario. I admire this government's all-hands-on-deck approach to bolster our health care system and this minister's evident dedication to students and post-secondary education, supporting students for in-demand roles in health care through high-quality education will support Ontario's economic recovery and help hard-working Ontarians in their careers. Speaker, I'm curious to know what other sectors the minister is supporting students in. So my question to the member is, what other initiative has the minister, uh, has the minister taken on to support students so they can get meaningful careers and make Ontario stronger? Thank you. And the Minister of Colleges and University. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for that question. As minister, I want to make sure students get every opportunity to get the skills and education needed for jobs in all sectors including new, innovative, and cutting-edge industries. That is why I was delighted to announce the new Ontario eSports Scholarship Program. 
Gaming is the largest segment of Canada's entertainment industry, with Ontario home to 300 video game companies. These in-demand jobs are growing here in Ontario, and this new scholarship program will assist colleges and universities with $1 million over two years to support students enrolled in programs such as video gaming, game development, and game design. Last year, the gaming industry contributed more than $5.5 billion to the Canadian economy, supporting more than 55,000 full-time jobs, including computer scientists, software engineers, data scientists, Response. and marketing professionals. This rapidly growing industry in the province is not only supporting our provincial economy, but it is also a critical piece to support training in sectors like healthcare, manufacturing, and the skilled trades. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Keeping cabinet mandate letters a secret has been a top priority for this Premier for three years. He's so determined to keep them hidden that he's refused to listen to the Information and Privacy Commissioner, the Divisional Courts, and now the Court of Appeal. This is public information, Speaker. It's literally just what the Premier asked his first cabinet to do in their jobs. That's why the Court of Appeal dismissed the Premier's last-ditch attempt to stall 55 days ago. The Court ruled he had to release these 150 pages of mandate letters so Ontarians could see. Will the Premier do as the courts said he needs to do and release these mandate letters, or will he continue to waste time and money on this needless and expensive charade? To apply, Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll help the, the member opposite. So, we were elected in 2018 with a mandate to fire the $6 million man. Check. We were eliminated on a promise that we would stabilize energy prices in the province of Ontario. Check. We were eliminated. We were eliminated to stop the 19% increase that the previous Liberal government had planned. Check. We were elected on a mandate to deliver a three-stop subway for the people of Scarborough. Check. Check. We were eliminated to bring back the 300,000 jobs that were lost by the Liberals. Check. We were, we were uh, elected on a mandate to end red tape in the province of Ontario. Check, Mr. Order. Speaker. On every single mandate, we are delivering for the people of Response. the province of Ontario, and we will continue to do so for a long time to come, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Uh, man. man, oh man. Uh, <laughs> speaker. <laughs> Back to the Premier. What an answer. I can't believe it. Anyway, now I know why is the Premier so desperate to withhold these letters from the public is still unknown, although the answer we got may explain some of it. What's also unknown is how much this ridiculous process has cost the people of Ontario. The government has refused multiple requests to reveal how many public dollars and government resources they poured into this three-year-long battle at keeping secret what everyone involved says the public has a right to know. If the Premier won't be open with the people of Ontario about what is in the letters, he should at least be open about how much the secret is costing the people of Ontario. When will this Premier reveal Question. to Ontarians just how much he spent trying to hide these mandate letters from the public. Here, here. It's, it's no wonder the member opposite is so uh, worried about that answer because he participated in all of the things that I mentioned. He was very happy to vote for a carbon tax for the people of the province of Ontario that would cost every single Ontarian hundreds of thousands of dollars, Mr. Speaker. One of the first things we did was eliminate that, Mr. Speaker. He was one of the architects in a program that saw us pay billions of dollars for energy that we did not need and could not afford. He stood up happily and made sure that it happened by working closely with his coalition partners in the Order. Liberal government, Mr. Speaker, because they worked together. So I understand Order. why he's stressed out, Mr. Speaker, but this is what I can tell the member. The mandate that we have, we are delivering on. 
Health care reform, we're doing it. Building long-term care, we're doing it. Transit and transportation, we're doing it. Better colleges and universities, we're doing it. Delivering for our students so they can get past the discovery map of the past, we're doing it, Mr. Speaker. And what we're seeing in Ottawa today, the people know, if you want a strong, stable Ontario, the only route to it is a strong, stable, provincial progress. Thank you. Stop the clock. Let's restart the clock. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. By the end of 2014 15 school year, when the full day kindergarten program was fully implemented, almost half a million of our earliest learners were already benefiting. This marked a major shift when this program was first announced in 2010 by the Ontario Liberals, and it amounted to the most significant investment in Ontario education in a generation. Students in FDK are better prepared to enter grade one, actually, and even grade three, and they are more successful in school. Thanks to the leadership of the federal Liberals, we once again have an opportunity to invest in our children's future. As of today, every single province and territory in this country, with the exception of Ontario, has signed and started to implement a childcare agreement with the federal Liberal government. Conservatives are ideologically Question. opposed to this childcare agreement just as they were opposed to FDK. They know that Ontario will not, Ontarians will not want them to cancel a program that they're benefiting from when they see the learning benefits for children. Speaker, will the Premier stop dragging his feet and sign the child care agreement with the federal government? Thank you. Thank you very much. And to reply on behalf of the government, the government has a leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, in the question itself, look, look at the question. In the question, she said, thanks to the leadership of the federal government, which means that for 15 years, the government that she was a part of yes. failed the people of the province of Ontario. So, in that question, so, and this, of course, is a member who brought forward a motion of support and confidence in the government, the first in the history of parliamentary democracy, where an opposition party brings forward a, a vote of confidence in the government and votes en masse with the NDP, begs us to ensure that we stay in government right until the end of our mandate, Mr. Speaker. But look, when it comes to child care, we're not going to follow the lessons of the previous Liberal government that brought us the highest child care fees in the country, Mr. Speaker. We're going to work on behalf of the people of the province of Ontario to sign a deal that is in the best interest of the people of the province of Ontario, that supports families for generations to come, Mr. Speaker, and not what the opposition would have us do, Mr. Speaker, disadvantage future generations of Ontarians to cut a deal today. That's not what we'll do. We'll do what's right for the people of the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier and his government. Speaker, this Premier and this government cite the costs of a childcare program as the reason for their delay. Kicking and screaming, they are being dragged to the negotiating table. However, Ontarians know that an investment of $1 in childcare will get a return of $1.50, maybe even $2 back. They know that this investment will increase labour force participation, especially for women. And it is Women's History Month, so that is very important. It will boost Ontario's GDP, as well as generate more revenue for this province. But more importantly, it will help Ontarians with the deepening crisis of affordability in this province. $10 a day childcare to Ontario Question. families who are struggling to cope with the cost of housing and food will make an enormous difference. It is already costing over $1,000 this year to Ontario families by this government's delay in signing. Are you going to give this money back to those families that are losing $1,000 because of your delay? Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, the government house leader to reply. 
Speaker, these are remarkable questions from uh, the member opposite. Her question highlights every single failure of the previous Liberal government. The reason it is costing families so much money is because of the programs and policies of that member and the government that she was a part of. The reason we have the highest child care fees of the province in, in the country are because of the decisions that you made working with your coalition Turner. partners in the NDP. That's why we have the highest child care fees. You have voted against every measure that we put in place to reduce those fees to right. poor parents. You voted against every single one of them. And now all of a sudden, members come now all of a sudden colleagues, the Liberals care about affordability. They didn't care about affordability when you work with the NDP to put a carbon tax on the people of the province of Ontario. You didn't care about affordability when you were raising what? taxes. You didn't care about affordability when 3,000 jobs were going somewhere else. People understand that to protect progress, prosperity and growth, a strong, stable, provincial, progressive, conservative government is the only way to do it. And on June Stop the clock. I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair and not directly across the floor at each other. Please start the clock. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Speaker. And Speaker, we are going to continue on the theme of the consistent failures of the previous Liberal government, but my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, as we all know, unfortunately, under the previous Liberal government, Ontario's auto sector was absolutely decimated. It was on life support. Hundreds of thousands of jobs fled the province. The sector had zero confidence in the previous Liberal government, and they simply saw no future here in Ontario. But, Speaker, things have changed under the leadership of this Premier and this Minister. Today, the auto sector is making significant investments in this province. And my question to the minister, please tell this House what recent investments have been made to support good paying jobs right here in Ontario. Great. And to reply, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you, Speaker. Last week with the Premier, we were proud to lead yet another game-changing investment in Ontario's auto sector. Honda Canada announced a $1.4 billion investment in their plant in Alliston to upgrade and retool their plant for hybrid vehicle production. And we made a strategic investment of $132 million to support those jobs here in Ontario. Through our Driving Prosperity Plan, we're focusing on transforming our auto sector and positioning Ontario as North America's leader in developing and building the cars of the future. This investment will secure thousands of new jobs at their plant Spons? in Allison, but will also create thousands more indirect jobs all through the province of Ontario. Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And again, thank you to the Minister for all of your hard work. Clearly, the auto sector now has confidence in the province of Ontario and in this government. And investments like these have transformed local economies, and they are securing their prosperity for years to come. Ontarians truly deserve a government that is willing to make these anchor investments in local communities, as they have multiple spin-off benefits and create great paying jobs for local workers. I see it every single day in my hometown of Hamilton. Speaker, there is so much more we can do and we are doing. So, back to the minister. Can you please tell us what this investment means for Ontarians and what is the government's broader plan to transform and secure Ontario's automotive sector? Great. Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, this investment from Honda continues the momentum of significant auto investments we've seen in the province. In just over a year, our auto and related manufacturers have invested 
$9 billion here in the province of Ontario. And it's because we reduced the cost of doing business in Ontario by nearly $7 billion annually, we have created the right economic conditions to attract yet another historic investment. This program from Honda only further solidifies Ontario's position as the global auto manufacturing hub. We are positioning Ontario's economy to unleash our potential and show the world our manufacturing might. We continue implementing driving prosperity, Speaker. That is our plan for the Response. auto sector, and it will transform the province's auto supply chain to build the cars of the future. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, Speaker, yesterday the province's patient ombudsman released a two-year report that shows that this government has uh, neglected long-term care for far too long. As we all know, nearly 4,400 uh, 4, residents and staff lost their lives in the pandemic in long-term care. But these problems weren't just because of the pandemic. These are systematic issues that were bad under the Liberals and made even worse by this government. As the patient ombudsman said, and I'll quote, no one in Ontario's health care system wants a repeat of the scenarios we faced in the spring of 2020. This will take strong leadership, end quote. Speaker, what is the government doing to assist the patient ombudsman to ensure that these complaints are handled properly and that Ontarians receive care with dignity and respect in our long-term care system? The government has to uh, well, I, th I think it should be uh, uh, quite obvious what we've been doing right from the beginning, Mr. Speaker. And of course, uh, uh, we welcome uh, the, the report because it, it really solidified what we already knew. It knew. We knew that we had to make important investments in long-term care in the province of Ontario. Of course, it was the Liberals and the NDP who worked together in a coalition who ignored long-term care between 2011 and 2014, especially at a time when the NDP held the balance of power to ignore long-term care at a time when it was so important. But what are we doing, Mr. Speaker? We're making important investments in staffing and care because we know we have to increase staffing, Mr. Speaker. We're going towards a groundbreaking North American leading four hours of care, Mr. Speaker. Again, something that this government is doing. We're putting the resources behind it. That's a $5 billion commitment, Mr. Speaker. And we are building thousands of long-term care beds across the province of Ontario and upgrading those old beds, eliminating Response. more beds. There is more work to be done, Mr. Speaker, but this government will continue to make the appropriate investments and get the job done. Any supplementary question? Thank you, Speaker. The report, titled Honouring the Voices and Experiences of Long-Term Care Home Residents, Caregivers and Staff During the First Wave of COVID-19 in Ontario, makes it clear that systemic issues are not being addressed in long-term care and in home care and community care. It's evident that patients and staff are not getting the supports they need to provide quality care that residents deserve. We only need to read stories like story number nine in the report that indicate that there was no assistance provided to, for meals for residents and that family members flagged concerns like dehydration and malnutrition, um, and yet nothing was done. Speaker, the patient ombudsman says that families are concerned that their loved ones are not getting the service levels they deserve and staff shortages are leading to patients being abandoned. The office raised that in 2021, that more than double the number of mandatory reports were made Question. by the ministry, um, of, and, and these reports outline abuse, neglect, or risk of harm over the previous year under this government's leadership. Speaker, What is this government going to do to implement the, recommendations, the policy recommendations in the Ombudsman's report and provide the care that residents in long-term care deserve? Speaker, what the report does is highlight the system that we inherited, frankly, and we all knew this. We all knew this. That's why it is so disappointing that when they had the balance of power, when they could force the previous government, their coalition partners, into making some decisions in long-term care, that's why it's so disappointing that they settled for stretch goal in insurance. But it doesn't matter, because what are we doing, Mr. Speaker? We're building new long-term care homes across the province. Now, while the previous Liberal NDP coalition were only able to develop 611 net new beds. We're delivering 30,000 new beds. But when it comes to the beds, there's no point in having beds if you don't have care. That's why we're increasing staffing by 27,000 positions across the province. Now, what does that mean Order. for the people of Brampton delivered by the President of the Treasury Board? What it means is 30 
five million dollars more for staffing for the homes in Brampton, Mr. Speaker. On top, on top of the homes that we are building in Brampton, Mr. Speaker, on top of the new hospital that the President of the Treasury Board has delivered, on top of the medical school, the university. Good Thank you very happy, much. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Brampton, the next question, the member for Ottawa South. My question is for the Premier. Now, we all know that Bill 88 is erroneously named the Working for Workers Act. Exactly. Because what it does is it actually makes gig workers, second class workers in Ontario, actually not able to get the same kind of benefits and protections that all other workers can get in Ontario. No health and safety protections, right? Not even minimum wage, because you're only paying people for engaged time. And that's like saying to a cashier in a supermarket, I'm only going to pay you when someone's standing at your cash. So why do they call it the Working for Workers Act if it doesn't work for workers? Because they like to say it. They like to say it. They like to write bills because they, they can put on their flyers, I'm working for workers. But they're not. It's not going to raise up gig workers. Not at all. No, it isn't. So, Speaker, when will the Premier actually Question. do the things that he likes to say he's going to do? Parliamentary Assistant, member for Mississauga Mall. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for asking this question. Mr. Speaker, as we know, in 2016, only 4.5 percent workers were in the gig economy. Today, one in five Canadians work in the gig economy, and the number is expected to rise. That is why, uh, Mr. Speaker, our Workers for work, Working for Workers Act 2, if passed, will make Ontario the first province in Ontario to protect the foundational rights of these digital platform workers. To the workers, I want to assure you this legislation will make sure that the digital platform workers will have the right to information how they have been penalized on their platform. It will require written notice if they are removed. It will give them the right to resolve work-related disputes in Ontario in the province where they work and they live. And most importantly, Mr. Speaker, it will protect them from reprisal if they seek to assert their rights. Mr. Speaker, our ministry has made protecting workers our first priority, whether you work in a big economy, whether you work in a big company, a small business, or any rideshare app, you will not be left behind in this province, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. So the Working for Workers Act doesn't actually give health and safety protections to gig workers. Right. It doesn't actually give them minimum wage. Right. It doesn't give them things like vacation pay or statutory hol holidays in some sort of prorated form. Not at all. But let's go back about Premier saying things and not actually doing them. Did he, uh, did he lower gas prices? No. 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 He would, hey, I'm going to reduce your hydro prices. No. I'm going to reduce your hydro. Did it happen? No. 12 no. percent? No. You know what? 20 percent income taxes. Election last time around, I'm going to cut your income taxes by 20 percent. No. Anybody seen that? No. no. Okay. Look, I, to be fair, we did get buck a beer. Ah. But you, you would be hard-pressed to actually not spend more money Carter. than save in trying to find buck a beer. So when is the Premier actually going to do the things that he likes to say he's going to do? And to reply, the government house leader. Speaker. <laughs> I, 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 I take my glasses off today because I noticed that the uh, Liberal leader has now stopped wearing glasses. <laughs> And you know the last time a Liberal leader stopped wearing glasses, it led to seven members in the opposition caucus, Mr. Speaker. So imagine, imagine the House leader for the Liberal Party talking about affordability and reducing prices. We eliminated immediately the Ontario carbon tax, and the member for Markham Unionville stood in front of that gas sign, and we saw the prices come down one, two, three, four cents. But you know what happened? The coalition team over there begged the federal government to put a carbon tax back on the people of the province of Ontario, and we fought it every step of the way, and we'll continue to fight it, Mr. Speaker. The legacy of the opposition and of this member is a decaying health care system, a long-term care system with 600 beds, students who couldn't pass basic reading, writing, and math, Mr. Speaker. What we've done is changed the province. We've saved the auto sector and transitioned it to the autos of tomorrow, Mr. Speaker. We're building sub ways we're building roads and we got back the Thank you very much.
The next, start the clock. The next question, member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, residents of Northwest Toronto, Vaughan, Mississauga, Scarborough, and Brampton pay the highest auto insurance rates in all of Ontario. On average, drivers there pay over $1,000 more a year on their auto insurance premiums than drivers in other communities. Speaker, safe drivers with clean driving records in my community are getting gouged because of our postal code. I fought against this for years. I've done the research, and it shows that the streets of my community don't even have the most accidents, yet still we're getting gouged. Will this government finally end postal code discrimination once and for all? And to respond, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite uh, for that question. Very important question. And uh, as you know, our government's keeping close watch uh, to make sure insurance companies are treating the people of Ontario fairly. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure the member opposite knows that uh, we sent a clear message to those insurance companies to provide relief. And in fact, by, yes, it did, the Leader of the Opposition, by $1.3 billion in consumer, or, <laughs> consumer uh, savings. $1.3 billion. Of course, that's a reduction in premiums across the province. Mr. Speaker, the best way to lower rates for the members of the opposite and for people in Ontario, in Toronto and all across, in Brampton and Durham and York and Peel, of course, is to implement broad, systemic, reforms which our government is continuing to work on. Response. It's important that these reforms do not result in an increase of cost for all customers. Mr. Speaker, we've done a lot through this pandemic for insurance premiums, and I'll have a little bit more to say in the uh, supplemental. Thank you. The supplemental question. Speaker, you know, if government ministers had the same kind of energy they have at deflecting questions during question period, and have that same energy on the golf course with these auto insurance execs standing up to them there, maybe we wouldn't be gouged. Yeah. But instead, time after time, the issue of auto insurance gets raised here, and all we get is PR from this government for auto insurance execs. Mm -hmm. The proof is in the premiums. I've said it before. All of your constituents, all of our constituents know this. Yeah. Speaker, last year, insurance company profits went up by 65% in Canada to over $10 billion oh, yes. for the first time ever. One third of those profits were in auto insurance alone. The MTO has reported before that Ontario has ranked in the top five for road safety in all of North America for decades. Yet, at the same time, Ontario drivers pay some of the highest auto insurance rates in all of North America. Ontario drivers are getting gouged, and we deserve relief. Will this government take real action to stop auto insurers from profiteering on the backs of Ontario drivers? Mr. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, only the member opposite and the party opposite would consider gouging a $1.3 billion savings for all Ontario drivers and insurance premiers. That 93% of uh, Ontario drivers saw a reduction in their premiums. You know that. You know that in, in Toronto, in Brampton, in, oh, the, you know, the, the data is out there. But, Mr. Speaker, we have more work to do. That's why we've been focused on things to make put, put more money in the pockets of hardworking Ontarians, like driving on the 412 and the 418. Those tolls, which were put on, in fact, the only place in Ontario where they were put on in Durham was by the previous Liberal government. We've taken them off. Mr. Speaker, the val tags, the, the, the val tags which went up under the leader of the Liberal Party's watch every year for five, six years in a row went up to $120, Mr. Speaker. This is a party, we are a party that's going to make life more affordable for the citizens of Ontario. We've done a lot already. We're going to continue to do more. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I understand.